So my name is Catherine Biotlotter. Um, I've recently just begun my position here with the university and the Icelandic Special Collections and Rare Books Librarian. So I'm very happy to be here today. And just a bit about myself, you know, I just started here. Um, my connection with Iceland is I finished the BA program with Icelandic for a second language. And of course I included the book Mentha Friday and Fjolsur. So this has been really fun for me to listen to everyone's presentation so far. Um, after that, I did my master's in information sciences and did my research on social media use in public libraries within Iceland. Um, during my BA, I did my research on Icelandic settlements in Saskatchewan, not Manitoba, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, so to begin with, I think I'm just going to introduce everyone. I'm excited to introduce, and I hope I really get the names right, Amelia Roberts, who is an English literature student uh, in the honors program at the University of Manitoba. Some of her current research interests include like folklore, Métis history, indigenous language revitalization. And she's gonna tell us ab about the giantess as other in Poetic Edda, Ulingasaga, and Gerda Christie's Blood Hoof, which I haven't heard before. So that's exciting. Um, after that, we'll have Zlata or Orbitz. Yeah, it's Zlata Orbitz. <laughs> Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, she's also an undergraduate student in the Department of English, taking theater, film, and media, as well as several classes within the Icelandic department. Uh, in addition to this, she runs the Student Association for the English Literature Undergrads. Uh, Zlata is presenting to us Trauma and Fragmentation in Grendel and Bloodhoof. And to start us off, we have Amelia, and then we'll do all the questions after. Are you ready? Yeah, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. All right. Okay, so good afternoon and I guess evening to everybody. Uh, thank you, Kachin, for your introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and thank you to Dr. Dustin Gerhardt for inviting me to share some of my research today. Um, I actually am living vicariously through this symposium because um, before COVID hit, I was supposed to be studying at the University of Iceland right now for an exchange semester. So this is the next best thing. So <laughs> this is pretty amazing to be here. So thank you. Um, so I just wanted to preface two things before I begin. Uh, the first being that Icelandic is not my first language. Um, so I apologize for any mispronunciation. Um, and secondly, um, I am tuning in from Treaty 1 territory, uh, which is the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. All right. Oops, there we go. So I'm here today to talk about a paper that I wrote last year uh, for a course that I took with Dr. Dustin Gerhardt. Um, I'm actually going to kind of talk about the highlights. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a background uh, to my research. Um, and I will be talking a little bit more in depth about uh, my reading of Yerda Christie's Bloodhoof. So 
at the time that I was taking this course uh, and writing this paper, I was taking both Indigenous history and Indigenous language courses. Um, so I think that really influenced the angle of my research. Uh, I focus a lot on uh, the Sami people. Um, and additionally, I was inspired by a variety of different texts that we were studying at the time in the course, uh, which included Halder Laxness's Wayward Heroes, uh, Yerda Christie's Bloodhoof, as well as the work of Danish illustrator Kai Nielsen. Um, so although I do not reference either Laxness or Nielsen in my paper, their work really intrigued me enough to begin asking questions about how the other is portrayed. So they're really strong influences for me. So here is a very interesting picture uh, that was really intriguing to me as I was uh, reading through these texts. So over here, you can see um, a three-headed troll. So <laughs> I know that this panel is the connection to the land of giants, but I'm actually gonna start by talking about trolls. So Kai Nielsen's illustrations, um, he's most well known for his work uh, illustrating East of the Sun and West of the Moon. Um, and a lot of his illustrations portray trolls, but they're usually depicted as very ugly, uh, very bulky. Uh, you can kind of see the comparison between the princess here. Um, but they're also relatively harmless and they're always outsmarted by the hero. So it's kind of a, um, a harmless way to depict the other. So in contrast, Halder Laxness portrays trolls in quite a different light than the illustrations by Nielsen. So I wanted to focus specifically on chapter 39. So it's one of the later chapters in Wayward Heroes. And trolls are depicted here as they're a direct threat. Um, and what's really problematic about this is that indigenous people in Greenland were portrayed as trollic and they were also referred to as skrylings, which is quite a derogatory term. Um, and the colonial perspective views indigenous people as the other. So I just wanted to read you um, this, a couple passages. Um, there we go. So it is said that the Norsemen in Greenland were little given to fighting and killing, apart from when they undertook to slaughter the trolls that dwell near the boundaries of the world, in which they called Skrylings. They felt that their own group was meager enough without killing each other, and they constantly feared being overwhelmed if the trolls decided to attack them in any large number. And then later, Tales were told that due north of Northern Sea were to be found the abodes of the troll races and sorcerers that the Greenland colonists called Skrylings. After the way that they wrapped themselves in scrappy, tattery skins and furs, the likes of which Norsemen were ashamed to wear. The Norsemen refused to consider Skrylings as human and declared them unfit to live, calling it a mockery of human beings for monsters to take on their form with eyes and noses and other human features. So I just wanted to emphasize the last bit because I think it's really gonna play into what I'm gonna talk about next. So another one of the texts that I really talk about a lot in my paper is Yerda Christine's Bloodhoof. So this is just an altogether beautiful work of Icelandic literature. And as Megan was talking about earlier today, um, it really emphasizes set, sorry, it really emphasizes the female gaze, which I think is really refreshing. Um, so it reinterprets the story of Freyr and Yerder. Uh, and it's told from the perspective of Yerder the giantess. 
so the original story is very much from the male perspective. So it's this total switch. Um, and Yerder, so the giantess, she's given agency. She tells the story from her own perspective and it really fills in the gaps um, that the original story doesn't really go into much. Um, so I think it's, yeah, a really incredible work of literature. Um, Christine actually uses a lot of empowering imagery throughout. Um, and my favorite is actually when uh, Yerder, uh, she's actually ripped apart and she resurrects herself by physically piecing her body back together, which is just this incredible image of resilience. Um, so there are numerous examples throughout the book that are just very empowering. Uh, so ultimately, Bloodhoof is a story of resilience and hope. So that brings me to my discussion uh, of the connection between the lands, the land of giants. So as I was reading through these texts, um, and especially after reading Wayward Heroes, I approached Bloodhoof with a lot of uh, curiosity uh, in terms of, I was wondering if Yerder perhaps was an indigenous person. Um, and as I began my research, I realized that this was a strong possibility. So what I found was that um, giants have often been associated with the Sami, so an indigenous people that coexisted alongside their Nordic neighbors. So the Sami were also referred to as the other and portrayed as giants, trolls, and dwarfs in old Norse Icelandic texts, such as what I discussed in my paper, uh, the Ying, sorry, the Ingling saga, as well as uh, the poetic Edda. Uh, giant land was arguably modeled off of the land that the Sami people inhabited, uh, which was often up north and separate from Nordic people. So there's a lot of othering going on there as well. And what I found to be the most intriguing was that Sami women were represented in the form of the giantess. And you can see that in some old or Norse Icelandic myths, um, such as uh, the Sirius's prophecy where the giantess plays an important role in the creation. Well, not in that this particular one, but um, the giantess plays an important role in the creation of the royal family by uniting with the god in order to produce a proto-king. So such is uh, the case with Rare and Yerder. Um, and Sami women were mythologized as giantesses but they were objectified for the sole purpose of giving birth to heroes. So that brings me to another point in my essay that I talk about, um, and that is that Christie also highlights Yerder's strong family relationships. So in the original story um, and in Bloodhoof, uh, Skirny, Skirner, sorry, um, makes a request to Yerder to come with him to his master. And she initially refuses. Um, and in Bloodhoof, it goes into a lot more detail um, about why that is. And I think that's really interesting because she tells us in Bloodhoof that She's content, she has a supportive family. Uh, she has no need for any of the things that Skirner offers her. Um, and she's not pressured by her family to go with Skirner at all, um, which I think is really refreshing and really beautiful. Um, however, um, there is, yeah, there's this really troubling aspect as well um, because the reason why Gerder actually goes with Skirner in the first place is because Skirner actually threatens her family. So there's really this 
strong connection between uh, Yoder and her family. Uh, specifically, um, there is a strong connection between Yoder and her mother. Um, and this is shown throughout the book uh, in terms of magic and dreams. And so magic was usually portrayed to be the weapon of choice for women in old Norse Icelandic literature. Uh, and it was used in order to prevent violence and protect family honor rather than to inflict harm and violence. And I just wanted to point out too that unlike Skirner, Yoder does not use magic to inflict harm. So when Skirner threatens her family, Yoder does not retaliate uh, in that way. Instead, she uses her magic as a method of communication with her mother and this brings comfort. So magic was believed to be used by the Sami and it was intertwined with an extraordinary knowledge of the landscape as well as the weather patterns. So throughout Bloodhoof, there is this incredible emphasis on land. And in, with the indigenous perspective, land is such a crucial aspect of this. So land is thought to be something that teaches you about life. And you really see that throughout Bloodhoof, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so there's this indigenous Sami relationship to the land and it's really powerful. So Yerda's return to her homeland, I think it's this really beautiful full circle story in Bloodhoof. And I just wanted to actually read you the last part of Bloodhoof. So this is on page, if anybody has a copy, it's on, on page 125. It's homewards with longing that my heart flies on, over water calmed by spring, over iron hard ice fields. And I wait for the end to come. My kinsmen will flock across the bridge, seeking revenge for their women folk lost. I hope that my kin will acknowledge my son and spare him, just as I kept them safe in days of old. I swaddle my boy in swaddling cloth, huddle him to my heart. There is my homeland, wrapped in calm of night, steeped in steel cold ice. So in closing, I wanted to read you um, a little excerpt from my paper just to pull things together. So in Skirna's journey, parts of Yinglinga Saga and Yerder Christmas Bodhav all address the other in the form of Yerder the giantess. As a female being, Yoder is objectified, silenced, and torn away from her homeland in order to satisfy Freyr's sexual desire. In Bloodhoof, she is given her voice back in a fictional retelling that seems to contain more truth than the original. The representation of Yoder as a giantess points towards the strong possibility that she was a Sami woman, arguably the very definition of otherness in old Norse Icelandic society. As many scholars, poets, and writers have begun to reinterpret the medieval legacy of old Norse Icelandic literature in post-war Iceland, the woman's perspective is finally being discussed, as well as the significance of the Sami people. This is hopeful. Uh, and just in closing, I wanted to quickly show you this map. Let's see if it works here. Yeah. 
All right, so I just thought I would show you this because um, it really highlights um, indigenous territory. Um, so I believe I'm somewhere around here. <laughs> Uh, if everybody who is in Manitoba. So Wayward Heroes um, talks about the Indigenous people in Greenland and uh, these are their territories. So I just wanted to kind of show you what that looks like. We have Iceland there. And then this is the territory of the Sami people. And also what's really cool is you can turn on this. And these are all the different languages. So yeah, that's kind of all I had to talk about today. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, that was wonderful. I'm sure there'll be questions for you after. I think we'll just move on to those last of them if you're ready. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to Dr. Geard for inviting me today and for all of you for coming. I really appreciate being here. Um, my presentation is also focused on blood hoof, and in particular, I talk about the form. And the title of my presentation is Not Your Tumblr Poetry, The Meaningful Minimalism of Blood Hoof. Um, this is a presentation that I gave for um, an Icelandic course I took with Dr. Geard, and I am excited to share it with you today. So uh, first of all, um, Emily's presentation uh, really uh, laid uh, the groundwork uh, to uh, explain what blood hoof is and what it is about. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into much detail about that, but uh, it's a book by Gerda Christney and uh, it, uh, who is a renowned Icelandic poet. And it is, I believe, uh, truly a masterpiece. It won the Icelandic Literature Award and uh, um, it is, uh, truly a fantastic work. I greatly enjoyed reading it, and one of my favorites. Uh, and um, it has numerous characteristics that establish uh, it as a work of modern literature, uh, such as the feminist approach, uh, as has been said, uh, the focus of the story is on a girder who is uh, a woman and uh, her experience of uh, being kidnapped uh, being forced into marriage and raped uh, is really highlighted and presented what it is. Uh, and it is not being uh, romanticized such at, as it has been in the original myth. Um, it also focuses on, um, has a, sorry, I'm just letting person in, um, a focus on the giants rather than the gods. And it is a pattern that can be seen in a lot of um, modern interpretations of Icelandic words. Um, and uh, while the, in the original myths of uh, gods were uh, worshiped and uh, then presented as uh, the main heroes and a lot of modern interpretations of gods are being dethroned and uh, giants and their experiences are put at the forefront. And that is very much the case with Blood Hoof. And another characteristic that really establishes it as a work of modern literature is its unique minimalistic form, which is the focus of my presentation today. Uh, so first of all, I would like to kind of explain myself what I mean by Tumblr poetry. Um, Tumblr poetry or Instagram poetry is um, characterized as being a uh, very um, amateur and uh, the focus is very much on uh, an aesthetic uh, and appealing image and not very deep meaning. Um, and uh, something that came to my mind as I was uh, rereading Blood Hoof last term uh, was the fact that uh, the layout of Blood Hoof was very similar to Tumblr poetry. And I was really curious as to why uh, 
in Blood Hoof, it really worked and I really appreciated uh, the way that uh, the pages were structured and how much text appeared on there and how very um, aesthetic and minimalistic it was. While um, obviously um, an example of a more amateur uh, writing was not nearly as appealing. Um, but I, I really focused on the form and I was curious to see where the difference lay. Um, and I also want to kind of show uh, if I cover the English text, uh, that's a page of uh, the translated version, which uh, has uh, both the original Icelandic text and the English text. So if I cover it up, it really, uh, the similarities between the two really jump out at me. Uh, so uh, something that I'm going to argue in this presentation is that in Blood Hoof, uh, this particular minimalistic form is a conscious literary choice rather than an aesthetic one. And it is uh, crucial to the way we interpret the poem. And uh, it really uh, allows it to convey themes in the best way possible. In particular, I'm probably gonna focus on the first part of the poem and uh, how this distinct form draws the reader's attention to other elements, uh, such as imagery, word choice, the use of repetition, and pauses. So first of all, let's talk about imagery. Um, this minimalistic layout of the poem with only three to six lines on each page really allows the reader to focus their attention on every single little detail, especially when it comes to images that they're being used. Uh, for instance, in the very beginning of the poem, the overall tone is optimistic, it's very light, it features Gerder in her homeland, surrounded by serene nature, fishing. It's a very calm and uh, pleasing um, environment uh, as it seems at first. Uh, however, uh, the uh, imagery that appears in that part of the poem, some of it is really quite dark. And the fact that uh, there are only uh, just a few lines on each page really uh, allows the reader to absorb all of those images from the first read. Uh, for instance, uh, there are, um, images such as a fish hook, which is also accompanied by an illustration of the book. Um, and uh, there's also the chain around Gerda's neck. And uh, so both of these really um, allude to uh, what is going to happen in the rest of the poem and to the woman's destiny uh, of being uh, kidnapped and uh, taken against her will. Um, and she is not really, she kind of is a prisoner to uh, Freyr, so does not have a lot of uh, freedom in that environment. So uh, I found those images to be uh, kind of a very uh, symbolic of uh, her destiny. Uh, there's also um, the image of um, a spawner swimming in the water uh, and uh, the way it's described in the poem is very interesting uh, because uh, she sees that spawner as she's looking down into the water and her image is reflected in the water as the spawner is in there. So they kind of become one. And uh, to me, uh, that was really interesting in the sense that um, the spawner is um, a fish that uh, is in spawning season. So um, kind of laying eggs and, uh, you know, the natural process. Uh, so it really seemed to me as if her destiny was defined by what was perceived as, you know, a woman's role at the time to uh, bear children. Um, and even though that was not what she wanted at that point in time, and uh, she did not want to leave her homeland or um, be with Freyr, uh, that was something that um, was kind of imposed on her as if it was the natural way of things. Uh, so that's uh, what I took from it. And I, uh, really think that the fact that uh, 
those images really appeared uh, only a couple per page really draws our attention as readers do. Uh, next is word choice. Again, the fact that uh, there's only a limited number of words uh, really allows Gerda Christney to demonstrate the fact that each word that is chosen really has to be there. And it's been selected really carefully and it uh, allows to convey a deep meaning. Also, another thing that is uh, very uh, prevalent about the poem is kind of uh, being able to convey a lot with very few words. Uh, for instance, let's compare a passage from the original Skirner's Journey uh, to Blood Hoof. So as we can see, uh, it, both of these passages uh, feature a conversation between Skirner and Gerder. Uh, and uh, he, at, it, as part of his proposal, he talks about um, apples of gold and uh, um, whether uh, that is something that Gerder would like to have if, if she agrees uh, to marry Freyr. And um, I would even argue that uh, the, uh, this passage in Bloodhoof is able, as you can see in uh, the original uh, poem, uh, there is uh, 55 words while in the um, Bloodhoof, 33 words. So there's a striking difference in, in uh, how many words are used and what is being said. And as I was gonna say, uh, I would argue that uh, this passage from uh, Blood Hooves able to convey a lot more. Um, in particular, uh, the fact that Skirner is talking only about uh, the apples themselves, but uh, their origin and uh, this uh, land of sweet calm and uh, leafy branched forest, uh, which is the realm of gods and how um, Gerder stresses on the fact that uh, that is not appealing to her and those apples would uh, really uh, stick fast in her throat. Um, and uh, that really uh, hammers home that uh, connection that she has to her homeland and the fact that she wishes to remain there and would not like to uh, go to the realm of gods. And uh, next, I would like to talk about meaningful repetition. Because of this format, uh, there is a word number limit that is put on uh, each page. And therefore, uh, Gerda Christney really has to pick her words cautiously. And therefore, whenever repetition is used is really striking to the reader uh, because of this uh, word limit. And uh, whenever it appears, it, it is very much intentional and it draws the reader's attention to it. Um, and uh, in a work like Blood Hoof, repetition plays uh, an even more important role because of this constraint. Um, so for instance, um, we have, uh, a description of uh, the horse that Skirner um, rides on uh, when he is about to uh, talk to Gerder. At this point in the text, we don't yet know what his intentions are. Um, and his horse is, is described as being dark of hue. And uh, later, right after it, it says that it's, um, Keen from darkness. First of all, I really appreciate the wordplay there and the homonyms, uh, hue and hue. Um, um, but um, what I really want to focus on is um, the fact that um, the dark or darkness is repeated. Um, and uh, for me, it really seems like um, the fact that this horse is. Um, kind of uh, is representative of an e evil force and uh, is accompanied by, um, uh, so as Skirner, as he uh, comes to a girder, he does not come with any good intentions. And uh, the fact that it is not only dark, but also hewn from darkness really helps to establish that. 
Uh, so it's as if uh, Gerda Grisney is speaking to the readers that, no, you're not reading into this. It's actually supposed uh, to be uh, dark and uh, there is a bit of a um, kind of, again, um, reference to what is going to happen in the future. Um, and then I would like to talk about uh, pauses. So while, of course, um, we talked about the value of space in terms of repetition and how, I guess, to repeat the same idea is a bit of a sacrifice in the context of um, this layout of the poem, to use spaces even more of um, a sacrifice. Um, and by that, I mean a blank line that appears in uh, between um, uh, different lines of the text. Um, and uh, it is especially important to think about the role that the spaces play. Of course, in each instance, uh, they uh, play different roles. Uh, for instance, in uh, this particular passage, um, this uh, is um, the place in the text where um, um, Skirner is uh, threatening uh, Girder and uh, actually he is um, kind of showing her um, his uh, sword and uh, threatening to attack her and uh, her family. Um, and um, the way uh, this pause is used there uh, really to me, um, when I was first given this presentation, I drew this parallel between um, uh, this particular passage in this space here, um, because it's like a song of a maiden who struggles and dies, there's a pause, and then her neck decked with a slash. Uh, so I drew this parallel between uh, this pause here and a method that is often used in horror or thriller movies when uh, before something horrible is about to happen, there's this pause. Uh, so um, here, um, obviously it is not a horror story per se, but the events that happen to uh, Girder are quite horrific. Uh, it is a tale of uh, a woman being kidnapped, forced into marriage, or raped, and her experience throughout all of this. And, finding strength uh, no matter what. So um, this in particular helps to establish that um, horrific imagery that is uh, going on here. And of course, um, in different instances, spacing can be used for uh, different reasons. Uh, so this passage appears um, very close to the previous one. Uh, so, um, here it's, um, I said, yes, I would come. And I saw my face dead reflected in the end of the sword. Uh, so this space here acts as um, means to juxtapose the agreement uh, of um, Gerda to come be Freyr's wife and her actual feelings about this and her dread and her fear. Um, so, this use of spacing really allows to juxtapose those uh, her agreement and her actual feelings really effectively. So in conclusion, despite uh, Bloodhoof having a very similar uh, appearance to Tumblr poetry or Instagram poetry, the use of form here is very intentional and it plays a crucial role in our reading of the text. It allows the readers to focus on the carefully picked out language in, uh, as I was talking about imagery and word choice. And it also uh, draws uh, our attention to things that um, appear to be so, somewhat of a sacrifice, like uh, using repetition or uh, using space in between the lines when the space is so limited. Um, and it really allows to draw the reader's attention to uh, the importance of those things in the text. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zata. Um, does anyone want to start with questions first? It's getting so late in the day, people are being quiet. 
Hmm. Would anyone like to ask a question? I know I'm terrible with questions too. Hmm. I'm really I haven't I haven't read this, these poems myself either. And now I'm now I think I might have to. I'm really curious about how the translations are from the example that I saw on your slides. It's a lot of, they look pretty good. And you can never tell when stuff is translated, especially poetry. I think it's always so tricky to, to get the, the meaning right and to choose the correct word. Oh, um, Rory. Okay. There's a question. I think the question the question was who oh, did the translation? Oh, I did the translation. Okay, thank you. That's good because I didn't I didn't get that. Um, yeah, I I'm not sure because I haven't read the translation. But I I, I always thought that translating poetry was so so tricky. Like especially we were saying Vlata about how the choice of exactly what word is used when there is so many words that could be used in place, but to pick the right one, I wonder if they worked with if uh, you worked with the author on it to make sure that it conveyed the message that they were going for. I'm sure somebody else wants to have a question. I can ask a question. Yes. Um, maybe this is to both of you. Um, very interesting presentations. Thank you very much. Um, you both kind of bring up the, the female gaze in things. So how do you think poetry can be a fun, not fun, but a way that us in the modern period can explore issues of gender on things that necessarily in the past don't have a, it's more of a male gaze. So how, do, how can we with poetry explore that? So if any of you can talk about that maybe a little bit. Vlasa, did you want to start first and then? Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, Emily uh, brought up this uh, term and I found a lot of interesting parallels between the two of our presentations. Uh, even though I focused on form, uh, the form is very much there to convey the meaning. Um, yeah, I find poetry to be a very uh, effective way of uh, communicating messages. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, uh, that happens to be uh, the message of uh, a woman's story uh, that is very tragic. And uh, um, it brings a lot of light to uh, the actual events of the um, original poem. I personally, while reading um, Skirner's Journey, uh, before reading Blood Hoof, I, uh, of course, found some issues with it, but because the focus was so much on the male protagonists, on Freyer and Skirner, I did not realize uh, the extent to which um, this story was uh, tragic for a girder. So um, I personally found it to be uh, quite, while I immensely enjoyed it, I found it quite difficult to read Blood Hoop and also um, it brought a lot of my attention to the possible, um, I don't know, um, my personal potential disregard of uh, some things as I'm reading older works of literature and how I um, am okay with certain things because, oh, it was a long time ago, I feel like, um, Blood who really allows to communicate the message that uh, the story of Gerder is not a romantic one as has been portrayed uh, so many times. Um, so yeah. Did you have any other uh, comments on the matter, Emily? Yeah, and I, I want to also second, um, yeah, just reading it and being it's yeah it's not a love story and it's very disturbing um and very challenging to read at times i found 
Um, but in terms of poetry, this was actually, I, I don't read poetry. <laughs> like, I, I don't know why. I just don't find myself reading it that often. Um, so I can't really speak to uh, poetry as, as a format, but uh, in terms of the female gaze, um, yeah, I just, I thought it was, I think it's just so powerful to get that total switch in perspective. Um, and I know uh, from the presentations more this morning that uh, there, there is a lot more literature uh, being released now that is kind of going in that direction. Um, so I think that's, that's really hopeful. So yeah, but <laughs> what an incredible book. And Zlada, I really, really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed yours as well. Uh, we have a question from Guy Stewart. He says, Amelia, as regards magic cast by women, why, it is why is it assumed to be benevolent? Okay, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I know the answer to this question. Um, I'm wondering what you mean or how, how to define benevolent. Did you not comment that um, it was uh, used for a healing uh, also in your slides? That mm -hmm. was I, I got the impression that it was generally thought to be benevolent for some reason. Right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I think, I, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. Um, I think uh, that's a really interesting point that um, magic is in this uh, context very healing um, as opposed to the way that Skirner uses his magic or threatens to use his magic uh, to inflict harm. So yeah, I'm not sure if anybody wanted to jump in on that. I think that's a really great question. Okay, well, we can move on to the next question. Um, somebody asked if, or sorry, Caitlin asked if you were able to engage with the Icelandic text and did this layout add anything in your opinion? Can you start with Slata? Yeah, I think uh, I'll go because my presentation was, uh, yeah very much focused on uh, the form. Um, the answer to how much I was able to engage with the Icelandic text is um, not nearly as much as I would love to. I unfortunately cannot read Icelandic. Um, however, I did uh, kind of try to um, re read through it um, as uh, and uh, compare it to the English version. And it seemed to me that the translation was very faithful and uh, as uh, to the layout uh, as well, I felt like it was um, kept as in the original poem with this minimalistic style and I highly appreciated that. Um, also um, a thing that was brought up um, during our conversation earlier uh, was like the issues of translation. And I definitely think that all the things that I mentioned uh, as relating to um, the poem, um, I guess I'm mostly focused on the translation, but it's like how many words to use and the uh, fact that there's this constraint and uh, how to represent it um, faithfully. That's that's very much applicable to the translation process. So um, yeah, but I would love to potentially work with the Icelandic text more in the future. If, um, I don't know, um, I get help from someone or um, I happen to learn a bit of Icelandic. Well, it's a super fun language, so I recommend it. Um, Amelia, did you have anything to add about the, the last question about the layout with the Icelandic text? It doesn't say specifically who it's to, the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, I, I actually don't speak Icelandic at all, um, but I I do 
Like I really would like to take a course at some point. Mm -hmm. It's on my bucket list. And um, I really do wanna take advantage of our Icelandic collection at the university. So yeah. <laughs> For sure, you have to come over and visit it when it's open. Since everyone's back in person. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? for our great presenters that brought their work for us. I really like yours, Lata. I was thinking like, um, you showed the two texts on the screen, right? Like the Icelandic and the English, were they on the same page together? Uh, yes, um, at least in my version, uh, they were um, really, was, like was a lot of, um, yeah, kind of like placed diagonally one to another, it's kind of like mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, um, it was it was very a very interesting edition. Not something I'm used to. I like bilingual editions. I usually I'm used to like seeing text side by side. So um, I found it to be uh, interesting how there was like a lot of space left in between. So mm -hmm. very much, um, yeah, related to the uh, minimalist approach and uh, some of the things I touched on presentation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think everyone hopes you get to get to Iceland soon. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Very jealous of you guys, but um, yeah, soon. Well, there's a lot of earthquakes right now, so I don't know if I want to go exactly right now, but soon. <laughs> well, I don't have any more questions. Does anyone else have any more questions or should we leave it to our organizers? Okay, I guess that's good then. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for your presentations today. I really appreciated listening to them. It was a lot of fun. And I look forward to hearing more next time, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So I guess I'll just pretty much close the event unless anyone else has any uh, last comments. But yeah, I'd just like to thank absolutely everyone who came and all the presenters and all the panelists and, and the panel chairs and everyone did an amazing job. And I'm really happy with how everything turned out. And there weren't any technical, well, I mean, maybe there were some very, very minor technical problems, but it seemed like it all went very smoothly. So really appreciate that in the discussion.